Fishing the DMV is close to hitting our first major milestone on Patreon of 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 38 Patreon subscribers away from hitting this first milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you will receive 5% off every order you get from Jake's Bait and Tackle. You'll be entered to win weekly prize giveaways, tons of private content only for our Patreon supporters. You'll be able to vote on new topics, where the show goes, and so much more. Again, we are only 38 Patreon subscribers away from hitting our first major milestone of 100 subscribers as we get closer and closer to our overall goal of starting a nonprofit to help stock our local waterways. If you feel like you can help support the show, I would greatly appreciate it. Check out the link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Any of her secrets, but we're going to bring her on later and let her share uh, for herself. So I don't know who the better angler is between the two, but that might be a topic of conversation as well. <laughs> Got a pretty good audience with us here tonight, so. Uh, but we're going to turn it over to these guys. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And then just before then, just because we did have a little technical difficulties, let us know how the audio sounds. And like I stated at the beginning, if you didn't hear that, ask a good question. If we pick it, you're going to win a prize to Jake's Bait and Tackle. So yeah, now let's get on to the introductions. Go for it, boss man. Hi, I'm Jeff Wolford. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Ah, uh, love fishing. Um, been fishing uh, all over uh, Shenandoah, Potomac, Susquehanna, bouncing around some of the lakes, Smith Mountain Lake, Lake Anna, for probably 50, 51 years. My dad kind of got me into fishing uh, when I was like five, six, seven years old, uh, pond hopping, uh, you know, pitching the frog in the grass and uh, throwing six inch rubber worms, and and uh, it's got in my blood, and it's it stayed, and it's it's. Obviously, it has not left. Um, I started fishing the river. My dad would take me down. We would bank fish. Um, and I ended up, when I was in high school, got a 14-foot flat-bottom John boat uh, with a one trolling motor on the back. and didn't take long to realize you're fishing the river. One trolling motor doesn't do very well when you need to come back upstream. Um, so then invested in a second trolling motor. Uh, and even had to break out the paddle at times with both trolling motors running wide open. So, but good times and uh, good good memories for sure. Um, got my first jet boat, I guess uh, probably late '80s, uh, middle to late '80s. Uh, just a, a Fisher panfish Fisher with a 40 Johnson jet on it. Uh, and man, I thought I was just going to set the world on fire. I could run all over that river, and. Uh, and then looking back at, you know, from, from then to now, um, today, how boats have come so far and, and the improvements that have been made and the horsepower, and it's just incredible. Um, and I'll be fishing uh, hard till the day I die. Um, that's for sure. So. He said, uh, you said you had uh, fishing in your blood, and I know this one has said before, Carly mentioned night. He said he's got small mouth in the veins. And so his partner here. Yep. Yes. Yes, sir. Bleed, bleed, bleed small mouth. Bleed small mouth. Yes, sir. And um, I mean, I grew up around Chandler Farms. So I've been, you know, we knew that, you know, I moved over like in 1968. And we used to wade the river. And, uh, and then we got into, you know, John Boat fishing, me and my dad. And then I started, uh, Fishing, you know, once I got into jet boats, it's it's a whole different category. You know, you cover water and everything, but um, it's just a different way of fishing. And um, we just uh, caught smallmouth like crazy, but uh, we just um, had a good time, me and my dad. And uh, and once, you know, Rodney Williams, I mean, Rodney, me and him grew up all together. So, uh, it's just a fun time catching fish. So I find it interesting that you, you know, and I think a lot of people can speak to that where you start off pond hopping, like you said, and you kind of get down the river waiting. And then yes, like, sir. I think everybody kind of started on in a John boat. Your first boat was, was a John boat. That was before canoes and uh, or kayaks. They had canoes, but you know, John boat, mm -hmm. you got out on that and you just kind of cut your teeth on, on that. And, uh, and then like you said, the advancement of the jet boat, 
Uh, tell us how that has just changed uh, fishing on the river. Well, you know, you start out with the John boat, and you're really limited. You can put in a ramp and go upstream to the first set of riffles or rapids, downstream same way. Um, we've even put waders in the boat and <laughs> literally pull the boat up through the, the riffles or the rapids to get up to the next good hole. Um, little, that's dedication, I guess you'd call <laughs> that. A little drive and dedication or small mouth in the vein uh, or combination of all three. Um, then, you know, you graduate up to the jets. Uh, I know back in the day when I got my first jet, um, there was some of the the older river rats that a few of them are still around. Uh, Pee Wee Gano, um, there was Tom Swain, there was Butch Ward. Most of those guys, I mean, we're going back here. These guys, um, they would tell you some of their secrets. Um, and... Those guys were running Duracrafts with 88 specials on them. And, uh, you know, we're running around little 40 jets and fishing a tournament. And, you know, you might be number three out of the hole, and they may be number seven or eight or nine or ten, and the first thing you know, you just hear this boat screaming by you. And there goes an 88 special. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, mm, but, yep. you know. Mm. And a lot of them guys, be holding the number up. Yeah. When they go by you. They hold that number <laughs> yeah. up. You took Just off to number in, one, right? yeah. and this would be number eight. Yeah. Exactly. I so that was, that. that's kind of a nice way of saying my boat's a little faster, faster than yours. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, and through the years, you graduate up, you know, you work a little harder, you save a little money, you see what everybody else is running, and you're like, man, one day I'm going to have that. Mm -hmm. And that day, that day comes if you're persistent and you work, and you hard, work hard and you're dedicated mm -hmm. and... You know, you can save some money. I, in, in today's world, that's severely hard to do, but you can. It can be done. Um, you know, and then I bought a 17-foot a aluminum weld with a V490, 65 on it, a Johnson motor. I ran that boat for years. Great, great river boat. Um, and then Jeff, had uh, he had an Express, 17-foot Express with 9065 Mercury on it. Um, we made a deal. I sold my boat. I bought his boat. And then he bought the boat, you know, ordered the boat that he has today, um, which is even a, a, another step up from what I'm running now. So with that, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, I got a 2000 custom built river rocket that I had in 18 that I built with a 200 inboard jet. And by far, it's unbelievable what you can do in an inboard jet out of an outboard jet. But, um, I mean, it's just a unbelievable boat. And, I mean, I can go places in this boat that I cannot go with an inboard, I mean, with outboard jet. And, you know, and, I mean, you can still fish the same, but it's just totally different. A lot of, I mean, I got the half-inch UHMW on the bottom. It's, you know, you can, you don't want to, glance it off rocks but if you do come to a set of ledges you can actually you know idle over top of them and slide over them that's what the uhmw is for so but yeah it's this unbelievable boat one question that we get a lot of times you know i think you get this in the shop and i get this in my comment section too is the pros and cons of going with an inboard versus an outboard and i think Personally, I think it's just cost. Like if I want to get a rock proof or a raptor, I have to mortgage my home. But you can get a 25 or maybe even a 40 horse Merc convert it and put it on the back. I mean, could you guys go through like the pros and cons of each? Uh, as far as the outboard, um, which I'm running now, 9065 Mercury, um, you know, that boat will run 32, 34 mile an hour, um, which, you know, a lot of people say that's too fast even on the river. Well, in some situations, it really is. Um, you know, when the water gets low, um, you really have to learn how to navigate <clears throat> the low water areas and get through the riffles or rapids and, you know, and pick your chutes, as they call them, um, going upriver and downriver. Um, for me, it's always been easier running upriver uh, against the current. Mm -hmm. seems like you can run shallower because, you know, you have the current pushing against the boat. Um, coming downriver, obviously, you'll run a little faster, but... Uh, it's like you don't have as much uh, reaction time mm -hmm. coming down river. When you get when you have to make that split second decision, um, you know, and and you can get in a in a tricky, a scary situation um, real quick. Uh, where the outboard, 
you can mess stuff up pretty bad uh, when you do get in that situation if you pick the wrong, you know, the wrong shoot. As opposed to the inboard with the, the UHMW on the bottom, you know, the, the better hull construction, your inboard, you don't have a, you know, your foot, exterior mm -hmm. foot that you can damage. And um, it's just like, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit better of a tank. You know, it'll, it'll, ta it, it'll take the battle scars a little bit better, um, definitely, compared to the outboard that I run today. Um, but, you know, with years of experience, you learn how to navigate the river mm -hmm. um, because if you don't, it kind of hurts the pocketbook. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just does. I mean, you can really ding some stuff up and, you know, and your foot and, you know, the impeller and liner, you can, I mean, you can rack up, you know, a couple thousand dollars pretty quick. I even remember in the early days, dad on a John boat having a little outboard <clears throat> prop, but they put a pitchfork on the bottom Testing. of it and mm -hmm. pull the pin. So if you did hit something, it would, it would fly up. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, nowhere near as versatile as what you guys are running now. Now, do you find that, uh, <clears throat> that experience when you're young, you mentioned, uh, fishing is the same, even though you're in a different boat, but did you find the way you grew up, like, for example, wading the river, did that, teach you more or are you still using a lot of those same techniques that you learned when you were a young angler you still apply those same skills today as far as fishing or has it changed um i think it's changed i mean it's i mean waiting and different with the mm -hmm. you know with the jet boat it's i mean it's there's no way it can be the same mm -hmm. i mean you just you come up to a shoot like jeff said you mm -hmm. you know you, Want, to me, once you make your mind up where you want to run, mm -hmm. don't second guess yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, I mean, with the outboard jet, you back off on the throttle, the rear end of that boat goes down. And that, to me, that's just, <laughs> you're in dangerous yeah. situation. It's going to mm -hmm. hit. But with the inboard. How shallow are you guys running? I mean, I can run in three inches of water in my jet, wow. in, in my inboard jet. So we have a good question here. This is our first one really on Instagram. And then I'm sorry about this, but Facebook has not figured out Instagram so I can share the comment up here. So I'm just going to read it out. Um, I love your name. It is ST0054, which is how do you know how shallow that you can run your boat? Is it just trial and error or do you have some kind of method? Uh, I know when I got my first jet boat, um, what some of the old river rats told me um, is, you know, if you can find an area that is, you know, sandy bottom, smooth bottom, no chunk rock, no ledges, um, you know, off the side of an island somewhere, off the side of a grass bed along an island. <clears throat> run that boat through there. You know, start out in 16, 18, 20 inches of water, run it through, get used to it, and then start bumping up a little bit closer to that island each pass you make. Um, once you get up there, you know, you get in 6, 8, 10 inches of water, and, you know, you go running through there on plane, obviously, um, you're going to look back and you're going to see that mud line, you know, from that jet blowing. So, you know, you're starting to run pretty shallow when you can, you know, you can look behind you and see the, you know, what that jet has done from the thrust. Mm -hmm. um, I, with the outboard, I'd prefer to run really no less than six inches to be safe. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just you really just it, it, to alleviate tearing something up. Um, but that's kind of what I did as I just got in out in some sandy area where there's not rocks and ledges. And I did what they told me to do, mm -hmm. you know, keep running as close. Uh, and then as you start running that boat, <clears throat> you'll get used to it, you know, how it slides, how it performs. If you have to, you know, take a quick left or right hand turn, it doesn't wash mm -hmm. out on you. Some boats, you, you know, the ribs don't bite very good. You have to back out of the throttle more. Mm -hmm. Uh, or to wash out on you. Hmm. Um, and a lot of times when that boat washes out on you like that, you know you're running shallow. Right. And there's not a whole lot there biting you. Thomas, I'm going to jump out and let somebody else get in here in a second. But one thing, I had a question for you too, because we have a lot of times people come in and talk about line size or, you know, what line should we use? You know, the discussion of braid to leader, mono, fluoro, what pound test. And obviously, you know, what you're fishing for, how big the fish are, you fishing the river, a lake, pond, mm -hmm. all those things come into consideration. But one thing I know about you, and I want you to talk to this because, you know, it blows people's mind. And I'll show them fish that you've caught, some of the, the bigger fish. 
um, that, you know, the Brady guy sometimes have, feels like he has to throw a break. Now, grant, granted, certain circumstances in the pads with Frog, you, you know, you need, may need to use that. Uh, but they're, they're afraid to use a light monofluorocarbon line. But you've kind of shown that you can catch big fish with light line. Can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm a finesse guy. <clears throat> I love light tackle. Everybody knows that. Um, I love taking people out and showing them how to fish light tackle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of it's in the rod and the reel. You definitely need a reel with a good drag system. I throw four pound line. I will literally throw four pound line probably 80% of the time that I'm fishing. That's crazy. Um, Why? Um, that's my confidence. Uh, like right now, <clears throat> how did you get to that confidence though? Cause if I thought going down, it'd be like eight, not like I'm a masochist. I'm going to start with four and work at four. That seems really, I don't know if I have the guts to do that. Where I really built my confidence in four pound test is trout fishing. Mm -hmm. mm. And I'm not a, I'm not a bait guy like power bait or night crawlers or mealworms. Um, I'm a jig guy, a mm. trout magnet, uh, a gulp mana. Yep. A crappy magnet. Mm. Uh, I'll take a brown trout magnet. Give me like six jig heads and six trout <laughs> magnets and send me down the stream. You know, and and uh, a many a day I'll come back with my limit of trout. And that's that's how I built my confidence. Um, you know, I go in Winchester Park and I'll go over there and, uh, you know, Arlene may be walking around the, the lake or you know, standing there talking to me and I'm sitting there trout fishing, throwing a jig. Um, if there's some bigger trout in there, I'll throw a two and a half inch gulp minnow. Well, we got um, some, we got some good questions here coming in. We have our first, um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we have our first prize winner of the night. Uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Uh, I can almost read that name from here. Carrie Timms, uh, here with Envy KBA. What have been some of your, of your go-to techniques in the river? So we're, that question will be answered a little bit later on the show because we have tons of baits, but just letting you know now that you want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle, um, message me on air, fishingdv at gmail.com, Facebook, or Instagram. The next question that can be answered right now is from JP. Uh, is he throwing th a four-pound floral question mark? He is. So what is the brand and your setup? So <laughs> good question. <laughs> And I was prepared. Uh, so my favorite rod <clears throat> is a, is a St. Croix premier. Uh, you know, it's like five and a half foot. It's, it's a medium power. And this is an important part for me, fast action. Um, I don't want a flimsy rod. I don't want a tip. That's uh, as you know, a lot of people say, well, that thing's a buggy whip. I won't even, I won't even pick that rod up. Um, Medium power, fast action. And the fast action gives me the sensitivity and it gives me, uh, for me, a little bit better um, hook setting uh, for the four pound line. Um, as far as a reel, I, like, like the Vanford, um, I do $200 reels. If you fish a lot, for me, they're worth the investment. Um, you know, and I have plenty of forty, fifty, sixty dollar reels, and they're absolutely fine, and they do absolutely fine. But for my style of fishing, for, uh, you know, for finessing and and light stuff, um, every little advantage that I can get, a smoother drag system, especially, I'm going to go with a, a higher end reel. What do you? Um, do? That seems so like, and that's a good old school there, because I remember growing up that I always used straight fluorocarbon or straight mono, and it really became newish this idea of braid to fluoro how do you keep the memory down on your fluorocarbon if you go straight fluorocarbon do you have any kind of tricks for that uh, believe it or not i don't use as much fluorocarbon as you think i do hmm. um a lot of people probably do think well he's four pound line light he's using a lot of fluoro um i really don't um the only time I really use fluoro is uh, if I'm throwing braid, then I'll tie fluoro on. Of course, uh, like up north, Erie, um, Ontario, fishing for smallmouth, um, I'll definitely do fluoro there. But um, most of the time, I, I don't throw fluoro. Why? Um, I do keep I do keep a couple rods with six pound fluoro on the boat generally at all times, but. Um, it's the confidence. 
if exactly. if I'm catching fish with this right here, and this is this is not fluoro, um, then if I'm consistently catching fish, you know with what I have in my hand, then I'm probably not going to change. Mm. Cool, baby. Yeah, and I mean. um, and you know, it's like I can walk through the <clears throat> I can walk through the store right here, and I probably have not seen. Roger and I were just talking about this earlier. I probably have not seen 50, 60% of the baits that are in the store right now. Um, I have confidence on what I throw. Um, I know what I can catch with what I throw. Um, and I don't really have any reason to deviate from that. Um, do I enjoy going out on a new adventure and trying this and trying that? Absolutely. You know, do I have a half a million dollars worth of tackle? Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. do, I, get a, I get a strong yeah from my wife. Um, do I have way too many fishing poles? No. Yeah. No. You can never have, I like your never had too many. You can never have too many fishing poles. Um, you got Bob Browning here said $100 price point spinning reels are as nice as 200, 250 price point reels. Don't tell Doc that or Jenny here uh, or Dios. I mean, I, I think that what's interesting here, um, you know, when I was a kid, you had to pay a little bit extra to get the quality to make sure the thing didn't explode, especially with bait casters. Bait casters sucked 10 years ago. They did like the lower priced ones. Now I do think there's a, like, why do you need that $2,000, you know, tesla shimano reel like it's it's not worth it you don't a hundred dollars to about 200 like that's works for pretty much everything honestly yeah. um yeah, exactly i mean the gear ratio and the, you know the way it performs is yeah you don't need a two to three four five hundred dollar reels you don't no you don't eat exactly the drag the drag system is the the big thing for me um you know and i find some of some of my cheaper reels that i use um you know, 40, 50, $60 reels and they catch fish, you know, just as well as a $240 reel. Um, there's no doubt about that. And I have plenty of them, um, as, as everyone else does. But, uh, you know, uh, again, when I put that rod in my hand, <clears throat> I want the rod that I have confidence in and I want the reel, mainly the drag system in the reel and it's smooth. Um, because most of my fishing, I, I'm jigging. Um, and it's just, it's a real quick, real quick jig. 95% of the time, I never feel my bite. When you mean jigging, is that like what, what the pros call now to gauge Demiki rigging, sort of speak, where you're keeping it off the bottom or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's absolutely. And what part of the water column do the fish want to feed in that particular given day on that particular body of water? Mm -hmm. You know, you're in currents, you're in slack water, um, you know, the species of fish you're fishing for they'll tell you, um, pay attention, you know, you de definitely have to pay attention and I'll generally start, I'll start deeper and I will start jigging off the bottom. I'll throw the bait out and watch the line as it's sinking in the water. And when it stops, I know I'm on the bottom and I'll start jigging. Um, I will always have a cadence with four pound line. You can watch the line dance on top of the water and it'll just be going back and forth. And when that, when you watch that cadence, when that line stops, I'm still jigging, but when that line stops, it's one of two things. You either just got bit or you're on mm. a tree limb or a rock or something. Um, so at that point, you know, you just load the rod. Got JP again with a really good one. Uh, I got the Shimano uh, stat, static uh, spinning spinning reels, and they are still in the rotation. It's worth to buy higher quality reels with, with sealed bearings. I'm not saying that, like, the higher quality stuff isn't an issue. I'm just saying when I was a kid, if you didn't buy the higher stuff, it literally wouldn't work. Like, uh, buying a $100 reel back in the two th early, like, early 2000s, they just, they sucked. And nowadays, at $100, bucks, $150, bucks, you, it's a pretty good reel. Yeah, it's amazing how fast the technology yeah. has trickled down. Yes, One thing I wanted to ask you three now that you're here, and don't worry, let's get back on the fishing here and keep the questions rolling in. So how did you three meet? Well, I'll just tell you, uh, <clears throat> these two gentlemen here are, are the reason that I, I've really taking on the fishing here in uh, the Virginia area, uh, moving up here from Georgia, being a green fisherman. I didn't know a lot about smallmouth fishing, and it's there's three guys that really took me under the wing 20-something years ago uh, and, and really helped me develop the love I have for – I'm a smallmouth junkie now, 
and that's Jeff. Uh, Jeff Wolford first carried me down on the Shenandoah River. First time I ever fished for smallmouth uh, in this area. And, uh, you know, he, he took me under the wing, I don't know, probably 20 years ago. And uh, has uh, been a great friend and brother ever since. And we've did a lot of fishing together, caught a lot of fish together. And I can't thank him enough. Uh, Jeff Miller here has, uh, I know, did not know very little about the, the Susquehanna River when I, you know, for a long time. And, and Jeff was kind enough to take me under the wing and, and show me uh, some of the ropes at Susquehanna fishing with him. And I'll say these are, these are two. Uh, and Kenny Gano's another, another guy that's uh, showed me a lot, especially out Lake Holiday and stuff like that. So those three guys have really tuned me into what I call fishing in this, definitely fishing in this area. And with that in mind, you know, I'll say finesse fishing, Jeff, this Jeff Wolford is just incredible. And, and these guys, I'm telling you, these guys are, they catch fish when nobody else is catching fish. It don't matter. I don't care if you're a guide, pro, whatever. Around this area, these guys catch fish when nobody else is catching fish. Jeff Miller is hands down probably the best crankbait fisherman that I've ever, ever seen. And I guarantee you, you can be casting the same bait he's casting, standing right beside him, and he'll sit there and catch five fish, and you ain't caught anything. He's just they, these guys are just awesome, and that's all I'm saying. I'm just thankful that I, you know, got to know them, and got to become dear friends with them, and uh, they, it's just been that's that's my association. Uh, and like I said, Kenny Gano also is another guy we've uh, fished a lot with, and they've fished a lot with over the years. These guys have won tournaments. They've fished. You know, they've caught some of the largest fish in this around this area, smallmouth, um, through the years. And like I said, you know, you're looking at 100 years plus fishing right here, and and Shenandoah River, Susquehanna River, probably what, 60 or 70 years experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's my that's my association. And uh, so, like I said, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you know, you uh, they were on the show tonight. Because they are full of knowledge, and I and I'm I'm just looking forward to hearing some of the tips and tricks of the trade. What have you guys noticed in the difference in the Shenandoah River over the years? I mean, if you really go back, we had the major fish kill. Jared, help me out. Is that the early two thousands, two thousand eight to ten ish? Yeah, early two thousands, and now we are where we're at. We are, I think, we have moderately stable weather conditions. If we could get two spawns put together, probably right. Um, I mean, where do you think the river is now compared to where it was back then? Uh, I know when I first started fishing the river, you know, you would throw, uh, whether you was in a flat bottom boat or you were wading, um, it was rebel crayfish and a floating Rapala. And you could go down that river and you could catch fish after fish after fish. Um, and you know, and when I first started, I never fished a river in the winter time. Uh, you know, really first getting into it. Um, started fishing later on once, you know, got the flat bottom and got a little bigger motor on it. And um, I know, I, I guess it was probably in the 80s um, there at some point that uh, was it Gary Yamamoto come out with a Yamamoto hula grub. 208. 208 color. And then there was that root beer looking color with gold flake in it. Man, the fish we caught. And, I mean, just set the world on fire with just those two baits. And then, <clears throat> you know, we got introduced to tubes. There was a, a little uh, tackle shop, I think it was in Berkeley Springs, called Bingo's. And a guy took me up there one time, and I don't know, it might have been 10 different colors of tubes was all you had to choose from. Um, and look at the racks today, mm -hmm. how yeah. many, you know, brands of tubes and, and all. But the river has definitely, you know, it, it's – the fishing in the river, it's it's kind of like uh, the water level. It's up and down from year to year to year to year to year. And if we can get some good spawns, you know, consistently two or three years of, of good spawns and not have a, a bad kill, then I think that the Shenandoah um, will definitely come back um, to the like it used to be, um, you know, back in its golden years. Yeah. yeah. Stay the same how little rain it got. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the drought has definitely hurt us. Mm -hmm. But if we can get some water that to be able to get to the wintering holes that we love to fish, yeah, I mean, it. I mean, these fish haven't seen the bait all year. So I believe you could have a good day. I mean, that's, to me, that's what I think. I mean, but, but you know, we need a rain. We need to keep doing the rain dance and get the water. I mean, the problem is the water comes up now and it drops so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may get up to two and a half or whatever, but in a day it's already dropped back down. So the ground is just sucking up all the water that we get. So it's absolutely crazy right now. This is the, the least amount of rain we've ever gotten. And yeah. Uh, talking to the DWR guys, and even you had Travis Eden on the show uh, last month. It's just going to take, I think, a good snow, too. We need a good snowy winter yes, sir. to actually help get the water exactly. back here. Um, one question I did have for you for you all is the whole the walleye population is absolutely booming on the Shenandoah River. And don't worry, guys, we're going to also get to all the bait questions, and also we're going to be getting to um, the Susquehanna River as well. Have the walleye affected the fishery? And I'm going to add one here because this is the hot topic. Have the muskie destroyed the smallmouth population like so many people complain about? What what have those two fish done to the river? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not a muskie fisherman, but the ones I've caught have been in the wintertime, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I'm <laughs> I really don't know. I mean Yeah, I think that's I think that's a tough call. I mean, everybody can make their own educated guess. Um, obviously, you know, right on Talk to the you know DNR guys and you know your 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 fishery biologist and such. Um, you got a lot of guys are getting into musky fishing, and there's a lot of guys are getting into walleye fishing. I mean, there's some nice walleye in yes. the Shenandoah, and there are some very nice musky in the Shenandoah. Um, I don't fish for musky. I do catch musky, you know, while I'm actually targeting bass, but um, in the same way with walleye. But um, you know. Those fish, they're they're eaters. Yeah. Um, you know they have the the aggressive teeth. Um, so, you know they're they're little bigger, little eating machines, and um, so they're definitely going to eat. Uh, and what are they going to eat? Probably <laughs> just about anything exactly. that comes in front of them that you know, that kind of looks tasty, um, including smallmouth, including largemouth. You know, chubs. Bluegill, crappie, you know, suckers, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, everybody's going to have their own opinion on that. Um, I would say it possibly, it could have hurt the, the you know, the smallmouth and largemouth fishing in the Shenandoah some. Um, but can't say for sure. Um, it's, that would be like... Uh, on the Susquehanna, the you know the big uh, catfish. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a problem. So there, there, you know, but uh, there's some big, there are some big flathead cats and just you know, in really? general, just huge cats on on the Susquehanna. Yeah. yeah, you know, and them smallmouth get in them winter and holes and and you know get against the rock ledge and you know and there's chunks of ice floating down the river and you know them big cats get in there. Um, and I'm sure they're eating probably pretty good. How bad is the catfish situation on the Susquehanna right now? I've, I don't really fish for the cats up there. I, I've caught some like really, really, I caught one great big flathead with Galen on six pound line on that bait right there. Really? Oh, that thing 20 was huge. pounds. Yeah. Good I mean, Lord. Ford Hunter. Yeah. Ford Hunter. Yeah. yeah. 20, I mean, there's yeah, a, Ford there's Hunter. a winner in 20 hole. pounds, may I say. Yeah. There's a, there's a winner in hole mm. at, I mean, if anybody fishes the Susquehanna at Fort Hunter, there's a wintering hole up there that used to be, you could go up there and camp on it for smallmouth. Mm -hmm. But now that the small, that the flatheads have moved in there, I had a guy talking with me and Rodney Williams up there. He, he told us the bottom is just full of flatheads. He said, you can almost walk across the bottom and never touch the bottom. I mean, this man fishes for flatheads like crazy. I mean, he, you know, and there's nothing to him to catch probably 20 or 30 mm. flatheads. Yeah. And there ain't any, anywhere from 15, 20, 25 pound flatheads. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and they, you know, I think those smallmouth do not like to, to be around those smallmouth. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I, I do believe that. But it's, yeah, it's, 
but I'm I'm not saying they moved every small mouth out of there, but they just they're pretty well taken over. Right. Yeah. Compare and contrast the Susquehanna River to the, the Shenandoah and really like the upper Potomac. Because I feel like if you're in this area, you might think a river's a river, I've seen them all, but I feel like the Susquehanna is a completely different animal than the Shenandoah or the upper Potomac. Mm-hmm. Who wants yeah. to go first? <sighs> well, it is. I mean, I started fishing the Susquehanna probably back in 96. And we used to fish the Butch Award tournaments up there. And, uh, you know, and getting back to throwing the tubes and stuff, we would come up guys and they'd have six or eight rods on the boat. And they'd have same color tube on every rod. I mean, they would. Really? Yeah. They, exactly. Jeez. I mean, they would, you know, they didn't worry about retying. They would just break one off and throw that one back in there again. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, that, I mean, it's just a totally different ball game up there on the Susquehanna. I mean, if you really think about it, it's a river that's, you know, we've heard guys say it a mile wide and a foot deep. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it is a magical place to fish. And, uh, it's just sucks that it's two and a half miles away from my house. You know, exactly. Yeah. It yeah. is. When you're dealing with that river and it is so wide, when I think of the Shenandoah or the Upper Potomac, and I fish the Bush Ward um, up on the Upper Potomac, mm-hmm. and I fish a lot there, you're really moving, I guess, let's say if the river's north to south, no. you're going up. No. Susquehanna, though, are, are you traveling as much up and down river versus left and right on a section? Like, h- how do you guys usually break that down? Uh, and that really depends on where you put in at, too. Okay. Um, and what time of the year. Um, like Jeff said, he's talking about Fort Hunter. If you're going down there, like, you know, now if you're looking for a winter and hole, you know, you're going to burn a quart of gas. <laughs> mm. uh, really? Um, you're not going very far. Um, as opposed to, you know, you get a good spinnerbait bite going in the spring. Um, you know, when they're really turned on water levels, five, five and a half, um, you know, and they're laying on islands and they're laying on the, you know, they're laying on the far back side of the island, um, right in the front of a tail race. Well, instantly, once you um, pattern those fish up there, and I think the pattern of the Susquehanna out of pretty much all the rivers I've ever fished is the easiest river to pattern fish in, smallmouth. Um, it seems like once you start getting bit, pay close attention to where, you, you know, where you're hooking up. Because there's so many islands and there's so many cuts um, that are just like what you're catching fish in right now, right in front of you. Um, and you, you know, you can fish out one hole and run up river, and you're like, well, they should be right here. And hopefully you catch fish there. Um, you know, hit two or three or four other holes and then go back to the hole you started at. Um, you know, because them fish are constantly moving around. And, uh, and more than likely, you're going to put more fish in the boat. Um, but I would probably say even on a good day, I'm probably not going to, if I'm hitting the Susquehanna overall running up river or down river, I'm probably not going to run more than probably four miles. And compare that. Like if you were going to do the Shenandoah or the Upper Potomac. Shenandoah, if the water level's right, um, and, and my confidence is telling me that I need to run (laughs) 10 or 10, 12, 14 miles. Yeah. I'm gone. There's certain, there's certain holes. I mean, especially on the Shenandoah, there's certain holes in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about wintertime that you got to fish. Yep. You got to have the water to get there. Exactly. If you don't Um, have the water to get there, you're. And I've set two, you know, 16 gallon tank. I'll put an extra five gallons in the boat. Wow. Um, You know, I've put in it at locks landing before and run all the way to the dam. Uh, they're on the bottom side of front Royal. Um, we we used to do that. Yeah. They're in the cancer. Department. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause like when you look at the Susky, it just doesn't look like a real river. It almost looks like the Mississippi or something like that. It's so wide and it's just, it, in some I'm parts it's so straight yep. versus on, I think I don't told people on this show and you guys, you, let me know in the comment section if I'm telling the truth here, you can look at a map and kind of pick out where you should go on the Shenandoah or the upper Potomac. It's pretty easy with Google earth. The Susky is intimidating as hell to start with. How yeah. how long on, on the Susky do you give an area? Because I feel like, let's say, a hole in the Shenandoah main stem, whatever, 
I feel like you can know pretty quick whether it's going to work or not. On the Susky, do you give it more time or less time before you move? On the Susquehanna, there's so many like different patterns, I'll say, there. Um, if, if I'm sitting on a hole 10 minutes and I've thrown, you know, crankbait Ooh. tube, uh, black and green hair jig with black pork, and, and I'm not getting bit in 10 or 15 minutes, Move on. I'm out of there. Um, I'm on to the next hole. <clears throat> and then I'm going to just look at what I just fished. My next hole that I stop at is not going to look totally like that different. hole. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a, it's going to be something totally different. I'm going to be at the back of the tail race this time, as opposed to the front of the tail race, or I'm going to switch from Island and I'm going to go and I'm going to start fishing maybe 30 feet off the bank. Now, is it going to be on the clear side or the muddy side? Um, most of the time, I'm going towards the dirtier water first, and uh, and then I'll I'll save the clear side for later on if you know if it doesn't produce on the dirty side. Uh, but with me and the type of finesse guy that I am, I'm not a, I'm not a bit afraid to fish clear water because I'm not throwing braid, you know, I'm not throwing ten well, pound test, yeah, four. You know, I'm throwing four pound <laughs> test and. And the way I way I finesse and the way I fish is I can I can make a long cast with a one sixteenth ounce, you know, little jig head uh, on that four pound line with that rod. You know, it's just a quick, just a little flip and it's going out. And with these heads being so light, I can keep that bait in that strike zone so much longer. And I can dance that bait. And this is what it's doing. It's just dancing. So much longer as opposed to you know, throwing a tube. I know you can drag a tube and get it in there and dance it. Um, you know, or running a crankbait through, and they may look at it, follow it, and then you know pull back. Um, but I will, I will go towards that stain side first, um, as opposed to the clear side. But I'm, you know, don't be afraid to fish that clear water. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. We're gonna go round table here, Doc. We're gonna start with you. We're gonna have to pick on yeah. you a little bit here. Yeah. How how's the Susquehanna changed in the winter time, in your opinion, over the years? Well, I think uh, basically it's the wintering holes have changed. In my from my standpoint, uh, you know, as as they were, as Jeff and Jeff were saying, you know, Fort Hunter at one point was. I mean, that was you go in there and you might see forty boats. Exactly. And you know, everybody was fishing for smallmouth. And most time everybody was catching something, but now uh, I think it's it, uh, with the catfish, uh, the flatheads in there. It's uh, it's changed. So, you know, I think I think now because that was a good that's a good deep hole. I mean, you can find 10, 12, 18 foot water in mm -hmm. that in that area, but now you're wintering holes. What I've seen uh, from from my experience on Susquehanna is that you know the, the wintering hole might be five foot. You know, yeah. might be five foot. Do you exactly. agree, Jeff? Might yeah, be five I foot. I agree with you. You know, uh, uh, you know, if you're fishing out there, you're fishing. You know, if it's two and a half, three foot deep, then you find a four foot deep hole. That might be where the That's fish a are. Deep hole. I yeah. think they will winter there. You know, that might be where long. they are. So I think it's yeah. just a matter of kind of uh, you know trial and error, figuring out you know finding the the uh, where the the waters the the deepest and and where you used to think the water was the winter holes may not be the winter hole now, you know? So yeah. that's kind of been my take. And of course I'm really a rookie, you know, at there, like I said, and, and, uh, uh, with that, but, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's what I've definitely noticed. Have you utilized, cause I, at least I know for your boat setup, you have a uh, forward facing sonar on your yeah. boat. Have you used that yet? Not to like, watch them bite the bait but to see if there's stuff i the have uh, you know matter of fact the last last couple of times i've been to susquehanna i've actually fished down there at fort hunter and and trying to you know just look around see if i could see fish moving mm -hmm. uh, absolutely not trying to you know video fish or anything like that but just kind of seeing what the makeup is and you know uh you know i've been in some places where you could see some fish moving uh but uh yeah so yeah i mean i've probably used it a little bit more than, than, than I would have used to, you know, have used it. Uh, I still hadn't got really used to using it in the real shallow water. Uh, but, uh, in those deeper holes, it, you know, I've, I've, uh, 
you know, I, I like to just play around with it. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm a, not, I'm a, just a, a fun fisherman have, trying to have fun. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I like to play around with that just, uh, just to see what's going on. You know, I've invested in it. So, you know, I, it, has it caught me any, have I caught any more fish using it? Absolutely not. But it's just a, it's something else. You know, I'm just out there to have fun. If I catch a fish, it's a bonus. And, you know, that's. Yeah, the forward facing sonar guys, don't we're going to be doing a show on that next year too, because I think that's something you can really um, integrate into your river fishing in some way, shape, or form. I see it on, on big slack and stuff. Those suckers get so sandwiched to the bottom, man. It's not like largemouth where they'll stack up on top of each other in the wintertime. They get on the rocks, or at least that's what I've seen. So it's not like you can. If I go to Lake Frederick, Doc, you and I, you could scan oh, over a tree and know, like, there's gosh. the crappie, there's a largemouth. A lot of times it seems like when you scan over a rock on the river, you don't see crap until you drop a bait and then they come off the bottom. And it's just, it's so interesting to see that fish behavior of like, they are, maybe they, I don't do this, they do this on all the rivers, but they will just like lock onto the bottom and just come up and then right back down. Right. And I've always had a high, just a, a crazy thought that I think they probably bite a bait harder that's coming past their face versus if it's on the bottom because it's that instinct where in the current it's either it's going to be gone they have to make a choice even in the winter time, yeah. and I saw that when I would just I would throw a jerk bait they always seem to be a little bit more aggressive versus if I throw a Ned rig or a tube on the bottom it seems like they'll sit there and stare at the damn thing for a half an hour before they make a decision. Do you guys see anything like that like on the rivers this time of year? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if I'm dragging a tube or, um, like you said, uh, pitching a Ned rig in, you know, off the end of a brush pile or, you know, a fallen tree, like at Riverton, for instance, um, you know, a lot of times a small mouth, they'll, they'll get just off of those fallen trees. Um, and, you know, a lot of guys are pitching baits into the wood. And, you know, you pick up small mouth now and then or even a large mouth. But uh, a lot of times there's three, four pound small mouths, uh would be laying where your boat's sitting now mm. um you know they're pulling off of that off of that structure uh, and you know and you pitch a ned rig in um and a lot of times you know you, you pick up they'll thump that ned rig pretty good um or a tube um you can definitely feel um if i'm fishing higher up in the water column fishing for the same fish you know not throwing a jerk bait but going back to my you know my finesse stuff um I'll fish that lower water column first. Um, if I'm pretty confident there should be fish there, then I'm going to, I'm, when I'm going to pick this rod up and I'm going to, I'm going to scale down, I'm going to scale down one size and then I'm going to scale down even smaller. It's like what we were fishing with the other day. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, and I'll, and I'll throw this through, I'll bring it through deep first, but then I'll, I'll keep working my way up in the water column. Mm. Um, you know, it's the same example. You're going to drag a tube first, then you're going to run a crankbait through, then you're going to throw a jerkbait. So, um, will they, I think they hit this harder. It's smaller in profile. To me, um, they're looking at this. This is an easy meal. Mm. And they're going to hit that thing and go and hit right back down, um, you know, to wherever they were hovering before. And, uh, where with a tube or a hair jig a lot of times, or even a rubber jig, um, and you'll pull up and it just feels like, everybody says it feels like you, you got a piece of a leaf. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel that slight resistance. So dope. Yeah. And everybody's like, you need to set the hook. And you know, I've seen so many guys I would have out in the boat, they would be tube fishing or hair jig. They would pull up and you'd look back at their rod and you could see that rod tip just starting to load. Yeah, you better set the hook. Mm -hmm. They're waiting to feel that bite. Tick. Yep. Well, when you feel that bite back, a lot of times they're gonna spit it out. They're spit it. It's gone. Yeah. Um, you know, you just miss that fish. But that's part of the learning curve. And, yeah. Um, Speaking of that, I got a question for you two guys, and uh, for a novel fisherman like myself, just out having fun uh, uh, this time of year, and whether it be the Susquehanna or the Shenandoah. You know, you don't get a chance to fish, you know, every day or you, you're just hitting it. You might not get to go, but once or twice a month. What do y'all recommend on for somebody who's just going out there and, you know, you're kind of going in blind. You don't really know what, how the fish are patterning. Uh, what do y'all recommend? Uh, for, what, what do you look for? I guess is what I'm trying to ask is uh, when you go out there uh, this time of year. Winter time. Yeah, like right now, this time of year. What if, if you're, what would you suggest for someone who's 
I mean, you're like looking, a you're looking for, fisherman. to me, slack water. Okay. You know, eddy, mm -hmm. you know, especially when the water's down in the 30s, upper 30s. Um, but a tube, I mean, that's a bottom bait. Okay. But I was up to Susquehanna last Friday. Water's 37, actually 36.7 when we put in. Mm -hmm. You know, and put it this way, at noon we only had four fish. So I made a move up to another spot. And then fish were on the edge of the current like you think they would be in the springtime. Okay. You know, and you, we just, it's just something, you got to, to me, you got to go different spots. You got to cover a lot of water. Mm. I mean, they're yeah. not in every every spot you go to, they're not there. Okay. But those fish were anywhere from four to five foot of water. And anybody knows the Susquehanna, we always say it's a mile wide and a foot deep. I mean, if it, anybody has ever fished the Susquehanna, I mean, it's, you put a boat in, you're looking at a river that's a half a mile wide. Yeah. And you look down at your depth finder, you're in two and a half, three foot of water. You're like, where do I start? Yeah. One thing when it comes to boat positioning, when you're dealing with, it's one thing if you're on the St. Lawrence or Lake Erie, and you can probably get on a spot a little bit more if you're in 30 feet of water. When you're dealing with a four foot hole, a five foot hole, do you want to be a hundred feet away? To peg a cast of that, do you want to be ten feet over the hole? Like what, gen generically, like how close do you? Want I mean, to if it? it's a if it's a big island and there's a big eddy, a lot of times I'll start way at the bottom and okay. I'll and I'll fish my way up. That's you know, it. And that's, some, that's good. You know, and good sometimes advice. they'll be in that four or five foot, and they may be right up in the foot of water. And I'm telling you, it doesn't make a difference if it's like say 36, 37 degree water, but to me. Start at the bottom and work your way up because they are, it changes every day in the winter. And we all know that winter time, they do not eat all the time. Mm -hmm. There may be an hour, hour, two hours that they do want to eat, you know, and it's, it's like we were up there last Friday and we got there on the water at 830. And to me at 12 o'clock, we only had four fish, but from 12 to 230, we caught 11 more fish, Dang. Yeah. you know. And fish, the water, and the they, water, they turned on exactly. Yeah, and yeah. the water got to like thirty-eight, I'm gonna say thirty-eight six. So it jumped up maybe two degrees. And believe me, the sun is your friend in the winter time. There's no doubt about it. How Especially if you can find some dirtier water. Really? Uh, yeah, that seems like that dirtier water will warm up. It may be a mm. half a degree, yeah, or it maybe one degree. Yeah. If you got a, a a long rock wall with dirty water against it, that sun's gonna hit them rocks and and and. You know, it's going to heat them rocks up, you know, for, in the period uh, through the course of the afternoon. Um, I don't know how many times I would go to a rock wall fishing in the morning, nothing. I was like, man, there's going to be fish on this rock wall go back two sometime today. Yeah. It's just a matter. I got all day. I'm patient. I'm a finesse <laughs> guy. I got all the patience in the world. I'm coming back. Um, and sooner or later, somebody's going to be willing to eat along this wall. Um, you know, and it may bump it up a degree, a degree hmm. and a half, but that's all it takes. What, what do you do on the uh, Shenandoah River? I mean, you don't have the islands on the Shenandoah River like you have on the Susquehanna River. So what's your appro you, you, your guys' approach uh, on the like the Shenandoah River uh, during this time of year when you go out there? What are you kind of looking for? Uh, well, probably right now, what's the water temperature? 38? 38, 39 probably. Probably 38, yeah. 39. I know they've had a little bit of a bite going on because, you know, this most recent rain, um, which we definitely need some more. Um, if we could get an, if we could get a rain inch and a half, two inches or get, you know, 12 or 14 inches of snow with a nice slow melt off and bright sunshine for three or four days be on fire. Oh, it would just be on. Um, it, it'd be time to call in sick from work. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, for me, if I'm going down there right now with that temperature, you know, like Jeff said, I'm going to be looking for slack water. Um, so pr I'm probably heading to Riverton um and go down and i'm i literally will start like right around where the um the uh, train track crosses right where the the mm -hmm. north fork and the south fork meet i'll start right there um and there's fish to be caught you know right there and just um right through there if the water starts getting pretty clear a lot of times i'm setting my boat uh, off of the bank about probably 12 15 yards um and a lot of times if i have arlene with me she's gonna be throwing towards the bank and I'm pitching out in the middle of the river. Yeah. Um, and you'd be surprised 
as to how much structure, and I'm talking wood and rock, is out in that middle zone in that Shenandoah River, um, especially in the Riverton area. Mm-hmm. You know, if you could ever get over there in the wintertime when it's what they call gin clear, yeah. and and just go on a you know a sightseeing day, of course take a pole with you, but and and just float down through there when you can look down and see the bottom in 10, 12, yeah, feet of 15, water. yeah. Um, You'd be surprised and, what oh, you see. Oh my goodness, the the stuff, the you know the, the waypoints and you know on your graph that you can mark. Um, to come back at, at later dates, but I, I'm going to start in that slack water, um, and I'll give that a while. But uh, just like Jeff said, don't be afraid to inch on up into that south side, especially if the water has a little bit of color to it, and get up in that four or five feet of water because a lot of times that's where you're you find some big small mouse, you know, yeah. pulled up into that that south side, or even in right into the mouth of the North Fork and all that rock. Well, look when you when you caught your one of your big smallmouth it was mm-hmm. what six three six five six five mm-hmm. that was February right? It was February. Um, Doc was with me. Um, water was thirty eight degrees. Um, we hadn't we didn't get bit at all that morning. We pulled up in a little eddy. Um, I picked up a crankbait hmm. on six pound line, and uh, I threw a crankbait up in that eddy. And it, it it just locked up. And I started kind of just like jerking. We started flicking the line, trying to get it loose. Well, there was no getting it loose. And uh, That's there, the fish. There, there's the fish. He just yeah. had it pulled up there. Oh, yeah, it weighed, uh, weighed 6'5". And that was caught on a crankbait, 38-degree water on six-pound line. I weighed, I weighed that fish. Yeah, and Jeff weighed that yep. fish. I netted yep. it, and Jeff weighed it. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Beautiful fish. That's, uh, that's the biggest smallmouth I've ever caught out of the Shenandoah. Dude, that thing's absolutely a freaking mess. Yeah. And then, guys, I'm going to be sharing I'll, I'll be sharing this uh, photo with you guys on the re-upload. Because, as always, guys, I'll be pulling this down tonight. Going to polish up the audio like I do, cut anything out, and then I'll re-upload it. And this picture will be in there as well. One question I had for, for all of you, uh, and now all of you got to answer. You can't have a cop out here. You're covering water, but you're fishing slow. That seems like it's at two different ends. A little bit of a paradox there. How does that work? How do you fish fast, slowly? Well, I can take I can take these baits um, here, like for instance, you know, sure. some of these some of these finesse Carly? baits. Or Jared, if yeah. I want to start covering water um, a little quicker, then what I'll do is I'll just bump up the jig head size. Put your hand behind it, Jared. It helps with it. Yeah. And once I if I bump up the jig head, um, you know, one or two sizes, that's gonna get me to the bottom quicker, and uh, and I can cover a little a little bit more water faster. This thing's so cool. I would rather I would rather for my style of fishing to take my time and you know and stay on the, the trolling motor more or set the spot lock. If I'm confident, I'm pretty sure there's fish in a hole. You know, I'll pull off of it and I'll hit spot lock and I'll just I'll keep pitching, you know, like these three baits, like especially right now, this time of year. Um in there. And you'd be surprised as what you can catch. How, if you had to put a time limit then, are you giving yourself 15 minutes without a bite, 20 minutes without a bite before you're going to boogie? Oh, yeah, probably 15, 15 I'm going, yeah. That's so weird because, like, when I always grew up listening to the Bassmaster, they always say about how you have to go slow and, and, and really grind through it. But as I've matured, it's like that's well, it's it's not totally, gospel. Right, you know? it's totally different from a lake than yeah, a river. Yes, that's you know big, I mean? yeah. I mean, the river is, the, is a different, different ball river. game. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's just. I don't know. I did. The oh, coldest water right. I've ever caught smallmouth uh, in, we were up on the upper Potomac. It was 33 degree water. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't, I'm like, we ain't going to get bit. I was just wondering. Mm-hmm. But we, Floyd Wharton, me and them fished, and we put 20 some fish in the boat at 33 degree water. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I wouldn't, I mean, if he told me, like, you going to catch fish? I'm like, no, we're not. But up there in some of them holes, it's just a totally different ball game up there. Doc. So, yeah, I mean, basically, I, I, sometimes I don't really get to cover that much water, you know, but I, I'm pretty much a slow, I, mm. I fish kind of slow, uh, but, uh, methodical. Yeah. I mean, I, but you know, I mean, remember I, I love fishing plastics. I, I'm a tube, I'm a tube guy for the most part this time of year, I'll be fishing tube or small jig, um, uh, and, or, 
you know, something along this line here, as, as I've learned from Jeff, you know, uh, I'm not afraid to use a, uh, the small finesse stuff. Um, but so that's kind of my method. I mean, you know, at this time of year, uh, of course, it'll change with the spring, you know, where you are covering more water. I love, I'll tell you what else, I, I mean, I love fishing a, a, a jackhammer. I mean, you know, a jackhammer. I mean, I'm not afraid to use a jackhammer. And hmm. Even even now, I mean, I'd use it like a crankbait in the right, you know, right time, of, you know, right uh, situation. But, uh, you know, what I think, I think, the, and, and I'll throw this to, to, to Jeff up there, because, I mean, like I said, as far as crankbait fishing, he's, as far as I'm concerned, he's the king. And what do you, you, would you, do you fish all? I mean, do you like, were you, are you afraid to fish crankbait year round or are you? I mean, I've caught them at, you know, 37, 38 degree water. But what you got to do is you got to get them down on the bottom. I mean, you throw it far as you can, put your rod tip down and get it to the bottom. And when it starts bouncing on the bottom, you can feel it. And you just kind of slow retrieve. Yeah. And then a lot of times you just, you don't feel them hit it. I mean, your rod will load up. It'll just start bending. And they're already hooked. I mean, they pretty much, to me, you know, they just open their mouth and they mm -hmm. latch onto it. But, you know. Yeah. Well, like Jeff caught that 6.5 was on a shad wrap, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Shad wrap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shad wrap. You know, of course, I mean, if you think about it, that's one of the, probably one of the top crankbaits for winter fishing. Yeah. Do you, you remember really, what the water temperature was when you fished that? 38. 38. Yeah. 38. Wow. So, you know, I mean, if you look at that, I mean, that's, like I said, you got, you don't have a lot of action. I mean, you know, it's kind of, it's got the big. No, the fish are not going to, to me, know, they're not going to go after it. I mean, right. No. And if it comes by them, they're not, especially a big bait or whatever. So I think that, I mean, that was, that was a great, yeah. great choice of bait that you happen to just pick up and throw. Yeah. And right. that was the only fish we caught. Yep. And it was, hmm. it was in shallow. I mean, it was right beside a log. If it was one to catch, it was, that's beside, the one to catch. it was beside a log in probably what, two foot of water? Yeah. It was two shallow. foot of water. Hmm. Yeah, but believe was, me. When the, I mean, was the water stained that day, or yeah, was it? It was, it was stained. stained. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but it was close to deep water, so you know, yeah. right. They don't have they didn't have to go far. Right. To jump back in that hole. I but, mean, my biggest smallmouth out of the Shenandoah was on the South Fork that I caught January first of two thousand nineteen. I caught that sucker on a on a tube. You know, it just and how big was that? It was five fifteen. Yeah. You know, that's my big biggest out of Shenandoah. And, but you just never know. I mean, you, if you, you just got to fish it. I mean, keep a, keep a line wet, especially if you love the wintertime fish. Right. Believe me, you might go out there and catch five fish. You might catch 20. What do you think prime crankbait season is for you? I'm going to say March is when I, to really get. Get into it? Yeah. March. Okay. Water temperature 45. 45, yeah. 45 to balmy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it all depends on, you know, how cold the winters are. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you give me yeah. you give me 40 degrees or above, I'm gonna throw a crankbait. You're gonna have one tied on. I'm gonna have a tie on. And it may and it may not work. But if you nine times out of ten, if you catch one on a crankbait, it's yep. a good one. We're going to have to get you guys back on for like a, a spring preview with Doc um, to really go through those baits. Because the one thing you guys keep hitting on, which is interesting, is the tube, the tube, the tube. Then along came this thing called the Ned Rig. Why does the tube have such a cult following and has the Ned Rig really uh, encroached on it? Is there a time that you use the Ned Rig or do you guys think that the Ned Rig and the tube are basically the same thing? Well, you know, when I look back, we were fishing Ned Rigs basically before the Ned Rig even came out. Um, what we were doing, we would take a, you know, a six inch rubber worm and we would just cut the, you know, three inches of it off. Yeah. Um, you know, cut the tail off and then part of the main body. Um, so in all essence, we were, we were fishing Ned rigs, you know, years ago, mm. um, catching fish. Um, but I have been on the river and, you know, hopping a tube, dragging a tube or, um, maybe throwing 10 pound test on my tube rod or eight. Um, and then pick up this with not this bait on it, but put a Ned on this head on four pound line and fish the same hole and catch fish. Hmm. Now, are they seeing the line, the heavier line? 
on the tube rod was the tube too bulky of a bait? <laughs> it, it's hard to say. But is, you know, does one outweigh the other? Oh, I mean, it depends on the situation that's presented to you. But, um, yeah, th- I mean, as far as will the Ned Rig outfish the tube, it could easily. Really? It could it could easily outfish that tube. Um, put in the right hands, it could easily outfish a tube. Now, you might go to the river the very next day and fish the same hole, and the tube will just wear them out. That's so weird. So, yeah, that's, you know, that's crazy. A, and we ain't even talking about the jig. No. I mean, I love throwing a jig in the wintertime. I mean, it doesn't have to be, I don't go much more than a three sixteenths and it all depends on the, you know, how high the water is. If you got a lot of current, you might have to throw a quarter, Mm -hmm. but three sixteenths is my, by far the favorite ounce I love to use. And we're talking winter time or just year round? Winter time. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I throw it in the, you know, spring or whatever, but once it gets up into the springtime, like Doc said, I'm, I'm a crankbait man, but. Wintertime, to me, a tube and a jig is by far the best two baits you can throw. I mean, I know a lot of guys throw a jerk bait, but I'm not one to sit there and, you know, and let it sit for 30 seconds or whatever. But you give me a jig, and I mean, it feels like sometimes I got eyeball. You know, the eyes on a jig, I mean, I feel like I'm the eyeballs of that jig. I'm looking down, and I can tell what's going on down there. But... Yeah, the tube and the jig are by far the two, to me, are the two favorite baits I love to throw in the wintertime. Well, let's let's get into the baits then. And then, guys, don't worry. I know you're all patient there. We're going to be getting to all your chats right now because we got like a thousand to get to. And then also, got a huge shout out with Instagram here. I've been counting. We got about 40 to 50 people watching on all of our platforms right now, which is pretty, I almost hit you in the head. <laughs> um, uh, watching on all the platforms right now, which is pretty crazy. Keep dropping questions. We're going to get to them all. So first thing we're going to be showing to the uh, old screen here is a tube. Now, you want to talk about what tubes we have here? I think is that a the... right bite? Yeah. Right bite right tube, bites. and yeah. that's a, what, peanut butter and jelly? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good call. I've caught a lot of fish on that bait. Um, it's a good, I don't know what it is about purple, but those smallmouth love purple. Even with, you know, getting to what, Roger Fuller tires. He throws a lot of. He ties a lot of jigs in the um, purple, but uh, I don't. I don't know what it is about purple. They I like it. They love it. You know. What kind of hook are you using? Um, I pour my own heads in the hook. I mean, I'll throw a one or two alt hook. I used to throw the sickle hooks, and um, I still use them. Um, but you know, three sixteenths is my favorite ounce hook to th- to use on those heads. And like I say, you get into when the water gets more current, I mean, if you can't stay contact with the bottom, you might want to throw a quarter. But uh, by far, three sixteenths is my favorite ounce to throw. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite? Yeah, I, I prefer three sixteenths or a quarter, um, depending on the current. Uh, just as Jeff said, you know, um, and you know, your green pumpkin, green pumpkin purple, um, some sometimes a little bit of orange. Um, Susquehanna, I know going way back, uh, Butch Ward would tie air jigs. Um, it was black with like a, it was like a hunter green, um, color. And then you would, you could put green pork. It was an uncle Josh made that. I think a green pork 101, I believe it was. Mm, yep. And, uh, I mean, you would catch so many fish, you'd have to retie only simply because there was no hair left on the jig. <laughs> wow. They would literally chew yep. the hair off of the jig from catching so many fish. And if the water's real yeah. dirty, I mean, black, a black oh, yeah. tube is, yeah. you know, we all black, used yeah. to Black's throw three and a half and four inch tubes. But when the two and three quarter comes out, I'd assume throw the two and three quarter inch tube. I mean, that's, I mean, you could probably ask nine out of 10 guys and they'll tell you two and three quarters what they're going to throw. With those jigs, what 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 is your setup? I'm assuming that's going to be a spinning rod setup or something like that? Or? <sighs> no, I'm, me? I throw on a bait caster. I just like throwing, you know, three sixteenths to a quarter. Now, if you throw an eighth ounce, you might want to throw that on a mm-hmm. spinner rod. But yeah, I'm not. I'm just not one to throw a jig on a, uh, especially for you know, quarter ounce, three sixteenths a quarter on a uh, you gotta put spinner your hand rod behind it because that camera's looking for eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's not looking at that. 
Um, and I love you guys in the chat. As soon as we start talking about the jigs and the tubes, I got like seven comments already. So I know what you guys really want to talk about here. Um, and we got a couple here. We got JP's got one here. That I think it's good at 38 degrees, uh, is the coldest I've caught a fish on a crankbait dragon, uh, dragon, uh, shad wrap slow with a pause. Um, that's a, phew, that's, that's cold water. Uh, we got David Williams, David Williams, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Um, as always, Instagram, reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me fishing at gmail.com. Uh, did any of you use blade baits during this time of year? I have done really well on them. My favorite is the Damiki vault. Dude, are you reading my mind? Cause I got three right here <laughs> that, that I like to throw. Um, I absolutely love throwing blade baits, even on the river. That's kind of like my little, my little secret go-to. We had another one and they said we, we had, uh, AJ Sipe. I think that's it. AJ Sipe. I need new glasses. Uh, good looking tube there. Absolutely. Uh, and we got, my God, what is that? Okay. Scarecrow. Thank goodness. Want to make sure I'm not going to get demonetized. Uh, is a drop shot any good for winter fishing? That's an interesting question. Have you guys ever experimented with the old drop shot at all? And right there is what I put on it. Oh, don't give that away. Don't give that secret away. <laughs> Only tonight. <laughs> Gulp. Um, Oh my goodness, Gulp is amazing. And what I really like size-wise for it right now is going with the even smaller one in the jar, which really helps. And move it over a little bit more, Jared. There you go. Put it right in front. Perfect. Yeah, that stuff works absolutely wonders. And it's the scent, too. I really think the scent actually is a huge difference there with that thing. Um, let's see. We've got a couple. Oh, we're going to have to get all these here. Oh, here's, here's a good one. So, uh, scare, Scarecrow, um, email me, fishingandmv at gmail.com, Instagram, or Facebook. You just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. What are some good go-to colors for wintertime crankbaits? I mean, anything to me in a crawfish, crawfish color. Crawfish. Yeah, anything in a crawfish pattern. Um, and, you know, the, the crawfish will definitely uh, kind of change colors uh, with, you know, with water temperature and um, you know, time of the year, time of the year, you know, and, and what cycle they're going through. Um, for me, um, springtime, um, I like something with some red in it. Um, and a lot of times I'll even pick up a red rattle trap, uh, even on the river, you know, red crankbait with black stripes on it, Can't uh, go wrong. red rattle trap. It's like the, once that water temperatures, but hits 45, 47, 48 degrees and, uh, especially if you get fish that are following other baits to the boat and uh, and shine off on you, um, don't be afraid to pick that rattle trap up because that thing's going to buy them so fast they have to make that yeah, quick they decision. Don't have time to react. Either. It's either a yes or no. I'm going to eat or starve to death. So, um, a lot of big, a lot of big small mouths have been caught on a red rattle trap. What is so that's so cool that purple is used on the river when you're thinking of a gin clear body of water and purple is used and really when you're thinking largemouth you're thinking black and blue and purple when you're dealing with a little bit dirtier water conditions what does that purple do to those what does it look like to them is, is it just a unique color for our area or is that working pretty much on any river you go to well you know sometimes the way I look at these color of these baits are they really seeing purple um, or are they seeing it as, you know, depending on the water clarity, are they seeing it as a, you know, is it a, a dark looking blue? Um, and what, what pattern are the, are the crayfish in? Do they have that blue looking hue to them? I mean, I've, I've caught fish and they'd have crayfish, you know, in their throat. Um, and you know, they'd have a little bit of that bluish purplish hue, um, you know, color to them. So, um, and, and that's another point, you know, you catch a fish and you catch a bass on the river and like, especially like this time of year or really any time and you bring it up and you take the hook out, try to get in the habit of looking in their, looking in their throat. Yep. Um, a lot of times, just so many times you will have, you know, a just eating crayfish and the pinchers will be sticking out. Yep. Um, you know, are they orange tipped? Um, if so, do you have an orange marker on the boat? Blue. Yeah, blue. Uh, you know, there there's a, a little dead giveaway for you. Um, you know, and if you're throwing a, a jig with a trailer, um, maybe like the old Gideo bug or something, a crayfish form, pull that marker out and tip those claws orange mm -hmm. uh, or tip them blue. Um, and, you yeah, know, it doesn't hurt to try. That's a really good one there. 
And then I, I got to get to these baits here because I'm getting just absolutely salivating looking at this thing. So before we answer any more questions, um, Jared, could you pull those up in front, the river rocks and the, tr the crappy magnet to show those things? Carly, there's a toggle there on the back of the camera. Could you uh, spin that to see if we could cut down the exposure rate? The little spinny thing. Perfect. Now that bait right there, you'll notice it has a little bit of a, if you can get the light to hit it right, you see a little bit of purple hue hmm. that it has. Terrible bait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, there's been a, been a lot of fish put in my boats on that bait. I can tell you that my biggest, my biggest smallmouth to date, um, weighed six fourteen, and, um, six pounds, 14 ounces. And it come off of that bait right there on four pound test on that. And that that's the rig right there on that, on that exact jig head. Yeah, gotta get closer. <laughs> just hold the, what ounce just is that? Just hold the hook. Uh, that's a one sixteenth. One sixteenth. You can't have no wind blowing that day. No. <laughs> That's what? one of my favorite baits, uh, even on the Shenandoah or, you know, if I venture north. Uh, now, was that up north? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. important. How did you find, um, who's the beauty behind the microphone? Yeah, don't worry, boss. You're going to be coming on here next week. That's so interesting because, uh, you know, we have a guy on Instagram right now who's uh, who kind of knows a few people uh, up on the Susquehanna area there. And they really talk about like the bigger baits for the Susque Susquehanna smallmouth because of like the shiner. I think it's the emerald shiner. I think. Um, Halicker, if you're in the chat, let me know. Um, you're talking about me. Well, bless you, sir. Um, so, thought. Sorry, it's chat. I'm reading chat, which is not good while trying to talk. <laughs> um, emerald shiners they get bigger, and so on the Susquehanna, generally the forage species are bigger, or there's more variety. But you're going with smaller baits. Do you ever experiment with bigger baits in the winter time, or do you just always like to keep the size small? Now, most of the time, I most of the time, the largest bait I throw in the winter is that the, the last bait uh, that Jared held up there <laughs> um, in my finesse arsenal. Um, the only thing bigger, maybe a, a Ned rig on four pound. Oh wow. Um, and from there I would jump right on up to a tube, wow, you know, or a hair jig awesome. or a hair jig. Yeah. I mean, um, most of the time it's a two and three quarter inch tube. Yeah. Two and three quarter inch well, tube. I mean, I've got so many three and a half and fours that. And they just sit. Yeah, yeah they exactly. Just, they I mean, the two and three quarter is just a, a mm -hmm. good size yeah. to use. I mean, I, I, now can you catch them on a three and a half and four? Yeah. But. It just you're gonna be more consistent. Exactly. That. I just and that, I do believe it. We got some questions here. We're gonna get into. Uh, oh, sorry. We got uh, JP. I'm gonna try to get my cursor there. Uh, Jared, if you could find that, let me get this. Uh, JP, I'm gonna get your question here. Uh, we got JP in the chat. What is the bait? Sorry, I missed that. If he mentioned it, uh, that is the River Rock Custom Bait. I think those pats are a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece. Um, <laughs> we got Jake on Instagram. Jake, I would love to share your comment, but StreamYard sucks, even though it's owned by the same company. I don't know what that's all about, so I'll just put it here. Uh, the hair jig is the is the jam up here in the wintertime. I mean, I know Jeff Little talks about that about three or four times each video. He absolutely loves that. Oh, great question I just created in my head. Uh, what type of hair? Does it matter? Do you use your own hair, deer hair? What is it? Uh... <laughs> Most of the hair jigs that I use, um, I think are deer hair, um, Roger, Fuller. Roger, Roger, full of Roger's jigs. Um, that's really about the only hair jig that I throw. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, in a multitude of colors, obviously, but, um, yeah, and I think most of his are, are deer hair. Interesting. Cause yeah, I know you can have like Malibu as well. Um, and then yeah, Jake just said that in the chance about like how Malibu is, is one of his, one of his absolute faves. Um, we're going to get to some super chats here now here in a minute, cause we got like a thousand and I can't believe we have so many people still watching everywhere on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And, uh, yeah, Facebook, if you're still listening, you own Instagram and Facebook. Could you make Instagram please work better? This is really weird. 
So uh, I have three monitor, I have three screens up here right now because the Instagram comments will not go over to StreamYard, so I have to read them off here. But we got about 15 to 20 people on Instagram viewing right now, which is pretty awesome. So let's kind of get up to the beginning here, and I'm just going to go from oldest questions to kind of the newer questions to make sure we get them all answered for everybody here. And Jared, Doc, you guys can hop in too as well and try to get some of these answered. Um, JP says, the Rebel Crawfish is an OG river killer. Now, craw you know, crankbait, we're going to have to do a, a write this down in, in your head. We got to do a crankbait specific show once the time of year comes around and we can just come in with all of our crankbait setups and just Google over crankbaits. Cause I feel like we could talk for an hour on just crankbaits. Um, let's see. We got, uh, let's see. Uh, it says sound. Yeah, we got the sound fix. Perfect. No problem there. Uh, here we go. I think we already did this one, but, uh, what's your take on the, I'm going to try my best to say this. What is your take on the micro pond magic by Booyah? Uh, is it a good finesse bait? I went fishing on the James, throwing every bait in the boat. Soon as I pick that up, I get bit. Now, does that have to do with that specific bait or the size profile of the bait? Uh, if you're throwing a micro finesse spinner bait, that's going to be more like an underspin too, a Panther Martin, something like it's going to have the same profile, I think, going through the water. Yeah, I mean, like you said earlier, the, just the profile of the fish, the bait fish. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very easy. It's it is crazy. Like when you say that, like how many ten pound largemouth that come off a Demiki rig or a crappie jig? Like I, they, it's crazy how small a bait they'll consistently eat. And I know like the glide bait is hot right now, but still that idea that you can still throw the little Demiki rig style bait and you could still catch an absolute giant. Um, good question, boss. And we're going to keep scrolling right here. I've caught massive ones. Uh, content says, hi, hello. Um, let's see. All right. We got a Patreon member right here that just said, um, I have no idea. Thank you. Are you searching? I know I speak for a living. I'm having trouble tonight. Is there more river otters now than there used to be? Is there less? That's a good one. And then we keep on going down here. Okay. Ooh, here we go. We got Big Mike's Fishing Chronicles. Can you use a glide bait when it's cold like this? For musky, yes. <laughs> Have you guys had any experience with that? I've seen guys catching them on the glide bait. Yeah, I mean, if you if you get bit, it might be uh, one of your best fish of your lifetime for sure. But um, that's just, um, I mean, it's as far as a glide bait, that's something I really don't. That's not one of my go tos. But um, I mean, there's definitely fish being caught on glide baits, so there's no doubt about that. Especially if that uh, if that's your confidence level, throw it. I don't. I think what's um, what's crazy is I got to unmute some of the extra mics there. But um, I think what's crazy is how much of an impact that glide bait has made. Cause I think the, the kayak tournament, the last Bassmaster kayak event that was on the Susquehanna, the guy in his arsenal was throwing a glide bait to those fish. Does the glide bait, tra are you seeing more people, like you said, throw glide baits now? And is it more of a situational thing or is it something people are just tying on and, and going 24 seven with? Cause I would think it's situational. I think, I think when I think about it too, I think it's kind of like the crappy guy going out there and trying targeting crappy and catches a six pound largemouth, right? And no different than a guy going out and throwing the big baits, trying to fed, catch a big muskie and catches yeah. a big small mouth. So I think, like you said earlier, fish are opportunistic. They've got to eat. They're in that body of water and they're going to eat. And whether that's a small, you know, little midge or, you know, fly or something all the way up to a, to a, a fish, you know, it's, they're going to eat. And so I think it's, uh, they're opportunistic. Right. I think it goes both ways. It is. You're right. Let's keep going. Scrolling on through here with the questions. Uh, okay, here we go. We got Crappie Kev. Crappie Kev, what line do they use, braid with leader or straight fluorocarbon? Uh, I think we we I think we kind of answered that, but a quick quick sit wrap there is not as much fluorocarbon. I'm I'm old school. I keep it simple. Mono. You know, mono. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I do. I mean, Jeff might be different. I mean, uh, I throw mostly mono myself too. Like I said, 
like I said earlier, the only fluoro I really throw, <clears throat> I'll keep one rod with six pound fluoro. Um, is uh, all of my other fluoro is, is uh, leader material tied on the mm-hmm. braid, and that's mainly if I'm up north fishing somewhere. Mm-hmm. What is the coldest water you ever caught a fish in? I just saw JP's question here where he said he caught one in 38. Like, what's the coldest you've actually pulled a smallmouth out of? Uh, 33. Mine is 33. I know y'all fished the Susquehanna one year at 400. Wasn't it like 32 something? Yeah, it was like 32.6, 32.8. I mean, you're pushing, you know, you're pushing right (laughs) at 33. And that's when I caught that big flathead too. Okay. Yeah. And we caught Mm -hmm. some, we caught some bass. Yeah. Hmm. Big big chunks of ice floating by the boat. (laughs) That's insane. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, that's, that's cold. I, yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, that's your surface temperature. You don't, I mean, <laughs> yeah. what is yeah. it down the bottom? Mm-hmm. I mean, is it colder or is it a little couple degrees mm-hmm. warmer? You know, I, I have no idea. You think leaves are annoying? Like, I wouldn't imagine, like, having to deal with, like, literally ice chunks coming down working a bait. Yeah, I remember that day it was uh, Doc and I was there. You would literally have to kind of look when you would go to cast because you didn't want to cast on an iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you would, <laughs> You'd have to time your cast so it, you know, it yeah, hit. Before it went in the water. Right. Well, you have ice forming on your line, too, through oh, your guides yeah. and stuff. Yeah. You have to break yeah. that off. Yeah, I mean, I've had it more with trout fishing. Yeah. But, that's aggravating right yeah. there, believe me. And we got uh, Big Mike's Fishing Chronicles again. Do any of you guys use a grub in the wintertime? I used to fish um, mm-hmm. a lot of grubs in the wintertime. Uh, my favorite would be uh, a smoke or like a dark, dark motor oil. Um. Yeah, definitely in the wintertime, cold and cold water. And were you guys throwing Mr. the yellow Mr. Twister back in the day? Or no? I remember that being popular, but I don't actually, actually, I don't know about the winter so much, but it was. My go-to was um, a black jig head, one-eighth mm-hmm. ounce mm-hmm. Um, with a white Mr. Twister. White Mr. Twister. Uh, also makes me think the Beetle Spin, too, was mm-hmm. popular at one point. Yeah. All right, we got a couple more guys, and thank you guys so much for your questions. So, if you guys want to get a couple more questions, we're gonna be winding this down. This thing's gonna be a four-hour ordeal for the holidays. Um, we got uh, someone needs to make a slow suspending rattle trap. I think there was one that's no longer. So, I buy all my rattle, my lipless baits on eBay because I really think the sounds different. So, I look like for discontinued models of like the one knockers, the hard narcos. Go online, look for those. I think Strike King, this is some juice. They used to make a silent uh, lipless bait. And I actually won an ABA. I won six grand with that, which was a silent lipless bait. But they don't make that style anymore. eBay is your friend for stuff like that. Um, let's see. I think we did that one. Have you fish rattle trap? It, yep, we yep we talked about that one already. We already did that. Uh, let's get all right down to the end there. I think we're all caught up on questions. What, John? Well, you know, um, so he, here's my bone for the day. Um, so my thing is, is I, I really enjoy taking young folks out fishing. Um, you know, don't, don't forget about that. Um, my wife fishes with me a lot. Um, sometimes you have to set her in time out because she will out fish you. Um, and, Good answer. but <laughs> You know, don't forget, don't forget to take these young folks fishing. Um, and you know, once, once they get out and, you know, they're either going to, um, like it or not. Um, and some of them will really love it. And then they may end up like Jeff here, you know, small mouth in the veins. Um, and, and hopefully they do. Um, but the two, the, this question was asked earlier, um, you know, what bait would you tie on? for someone that you're taking out tomorrow fishing on the Shenandoah River. Um, right here is the bait that I would tie on. If I'm taking someone out tomorrow on the Shenandoah River, and I'm going to have, <clears throat> you know, the five-and-a-half-foot St. Croix rod with four-pound line, um, that little bait right there with that black head uh, will pretty much catch – really any fish in the Shenandoah River. I mean, I've caught carp on that thing. I uh, hooked catfish. Oh, yeah, a lot of catfish. Crappy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's just a little power bait mount, and it's a smelt color. Um, you know, they can throw it out and wind it in slow. They can jig it. Um, but it is, it's a really good go-to bait. Um, you know, and especially for taking young folks out, you really, you want them to catch fish. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, a lot of times they, they get bored quick and I understand that, 
But that, uh, so that's my little bone for the day. <laughs> we got Scarecrow again. We got two more questions, guys. We're gonna round. We're gonna wrap this up here. Uh, do any? Does anybody use shad wraps for jigging? I have always been interested in how people catch cold water bass on them. I will personally throw my two cents in there. I know that's used a lot on, on lakes around here for perch, crappie, things like that. Um, do you use some kind of jigging wrap? Have you have you ever experimented with that before for river river fish? Uh, I've never really uh, vertical jigged um, the shad wraps. I used to vertical jig um, rattle traps. Um, way back in the day, um, kind of like you would a silver buddy or, you know, a blade bait of any kind, really. Um, but we would vertical jig with rattle traps, but that was mainly on lakes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then we got JP. Um, I think I gave you a gift card. If I didn't give you a gift card, let me know if I didn't give you a gift card because you want a gift card. Uh, JP, uh, man sting grub, man stingray grub is an old school winter killer for sure. Absolutely. I don't, it's so weird because I think when the swim bait came along, the grub kind of fell out of fashion because I mm -hmm. remember old school, you know, the, the the linders, like they really, that, that smallmouth Bible they made, I still have it actually. It's actually, guys, it's in my studio behind me. You see it there, but they used to swim grubs. But I think they used to do that before you had little Kytex and things like that mm -hmm. to throw to get that little movement. Mm -hmm. But have you guys, when was the last time you guys used a grub? Honestly, can you remember? Because it was like when I was a 10 year old, it's probably the last time I threw a grub. I know Ray threw it on the Susquehanna uh, about a month ago. I, had a I used to throw it down on lakes in yeah. Tennessee. We used to fish down there in the, at, you know, at nighttime mm -hmm. throwing grubs, but. Uh, They'll still it. work. I mean, like well, you said, yeah. like you were saying earlier, new stuff has come out. Well, it's something that they don't see anymore. Is, yeah. I mean, you yeah. Exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, the grub will still work. It's a bottom bait. I mean, to me, if you, you know, you just get the confidence. I mean, yeah, that's with any bait. That's right. You know, if you don't have confidence in it, a bait you're throwing, you might as well just leave it in the mm -hmm. in the box. We got a fan there. What? Give us a bone about the Susquehanna. Um, I mean. Springtime, I'm saying March, April, May. June, July? I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it all depends on the water level. I mean, you know, to me, March is when you got water that's, you know, 45, 50 degrees. You know, it all depends on your, you know, how the winter is. You put a crankbait on, you just, it, you can cover so much water with a crankbait. And um, fish with a crankbait. <laughs> I don't want to give. I, I don't want to give you the one that I throw <laughs> because they do not make it anymore. Yeah, well, the, but what about the ones they make? Um, I, you, you know, I was. Gonna, I want to get into that. Like, I know a lot of old guys that they will go on eBay and they will buy. <laughs> no, here, they'll, they'll buy the 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 OG Bagleys that are like, yeah, for like two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks for one lure. And my thought is my confidence would be shot if I'm in a tournament, I break that damn thing off and that's all I got. And so what, unless you have a thousand of them, like how do you mentally say like, okay, I have this one special crankbait that if I lose this, I am just going to be depressed for a month. Like, well, if that's... the water's warm, I'm going in after. <laughs> Believe me. I will. I mean, there's a certain crankbait that I throw that <laughs> I'm telling you, I'll do all I, I'll put 120% in to try to get it. But yeah, I do. Sometimes you do lose them, but those things are priceless. Exactly. That's the thing. How many do like, you have left? Enough. <laughs> enough. He's gonna share with me. <laughs> yeah. What? Probably you, twenty. Bargain. Probably twenty something. Twenty something. Do, do you change okay. the hooks out at that at all? And do you prefer round bends or, or circle or tre like what kind of hooks do you like for your crankbaits? Um. No. I, I mean, long as they're sharp. That's. There's um. Yeah, that don't really bother me. I mean, long as long as they're good and sharp, I, I have no problem. I mean, there's so many different hooks out there. I use a lot of the uh, KVD, the triple grips, tying. Grip, yeah, yeah. I, I I prefer the triple grips yeah. just because with the small mouth, especially when it gets hotter out. Yeah. If you hook them, you're probably gonna get them in the boat. But mm -hmm. when you have those round ones, a jerk bait, guys, I love the Aaron Martin's um, finesse Gamagatsu. Someone in the chat will help me out. I'll, yeah. I'll I'll link it. But those things are sticky sharp, but. When I put those on crankbaits, I seen like when they would jump, they'd throw those things. But when you get those triple grips that are just like gaffs and you get them, you you can get them in the boat pretty much. Yeah. You're not going to lose well, them. Well, you know, on a crankbait, they, they they seem to just 
go hog wild when you hook them. I mean, mm-hmm. They jump out of the water, and you know it. I mean, that's a smallmouth. Like I say, they just uh, they're just some fish with an attitude, is what I call them. <laughs> you were talking about taking kids. I know too. You've had a lot of good success with your dad on the river, um, and that's kind of cool too to see you sharing that with your dad. Still, how old your dad? And and my dad just turned seventy eight December. So 17. and he still gets out, and you guys still yeah. have a good he time together. You don't get out in the winter time like he used yeah. to. So yeah. we we have a guy called Jeff Little in the chat. He yep. says, uh, "I've swum. I I, th- I think he fishes a little bit. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I I've swum with the original live target crawl crank." I'd believe that. You could tell me anything about that, and I would believe it, well, uh, Jeff. Yeah. Yes, sir. How much has kayaking affected the rivers? Um, and I really wanted to, like, I think the Susquehanna, I I could be wrong. I don't think it's bad because it's such a big river. It can take it. But right. when you're talking about kayak tournaments on the the South Fork, on the main stem of the Upper Potomac of the Shenandoah, like, it, it, is it affecting the pressure? Is it pressuring them differently? What is it doing? If anything. <laughs> um, How many have you run over? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, only time I've ever, you know, they would be in a chute where I'd have to run, you know, with the jet boat. And a lot of times they're out of the, out of the kayak in the water, you know, and I mean, sometimes you got to come up to them and say, Hey, I, I got to run through this chute mm-hmm. here, mm-hmm. but then you just, they'll part ways and you got to run. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, but, when you got high water, you have you know had no problem. But yeah, I I really have no problem with them. I mean, not at all. I mean, you see a lot of them down around um, below lock, mm-hmm. around Watermill, water, Watermill Park. Watermill Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have any. I don't have. I mean, I own kayaks. So I'm, really, yeah, yeah. I have three kayaks. I love fishing out of kayaks, fresh water and salt water. Um, so you know, really, yeah. I don't I don't have any issues at all with kayaks. Um, you know, everybody's entitled to, uh, you know, whatever craft they want to be in. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's their choice. Um, yeah. You know, you just got to respect, uh, and like, right. like Jeff said, you know, I've come up on, you know, a set of riffles or, or rapids and, you know, and there's kayaks and I've come up on people waiting or standing right in the chute, you know, and I'd idle up and, you know, politely ask them if they could just move off to the side for just a few minutes, you know. So I could, you know, navigate on up through the water and and thank them and go on your way. What is saltwater kayak fishing like? It's it's a blast <laughs> for um, speckled trout, flounder, redfish. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. You get on. Uh, I mean, my stomping grounds of Pimlico Sound down around Buxton, North Carolina, uh, Frisco, North Carolina, in there. Um, it is. Uh, you can get on a good, uh, you know, speck speckled trout bite. It is. It's it's a lot of fun. It's interesting because, you know, we've talked to the Chesapeake Bay Association this year, the mm-hmm. Potomac Rivers Association with Gary Martin and David Sikorsky talking about, you know, the striped bass fishery here. It it could be on on the outs. We don't know because of, of multitude of factors, but this is probably the best speckled trout and red drum fishing we have in the bay right now. And it's it's crazy to think the thing is going to get better. We're, I think that's a huge market for kayaking now because that mm-hmm. used to be the hot ticket down south. But mm-hmm. if that becomes a mainstay in the Chesapeake Bay and, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, I, mm-hmm. that's going to be freaking awesome mm-hmm. to see around here. Just more fishing opportunities for everybody. Yeah, the, I know the, uh, the speckled trout fishing in the Pimlico Sound for the last couple of years has just been astounding. I mean, some of the, the size of some of these specks that are being caught um, and not necessarily mm. being caught by, you know, locals or, or guides with clients out, you know, just your, your everyday guy down there. It's on vacation for a week. It's going out, um, you know, throwing a, an electric chicken, which is a pink and green color, um, Fun name. Throwing an electric chicken little swim bait. You need to name a horse that. Um, yeah, electric chicken is a good name. <laughs> you know, and that, that electric chicken, it's that's a good freshwater color uh, bait too. Um, but for salt water, it's uh, you walk into a tackle shop, and a lot of times you'll go up, whether it's a gulp product or whatever it may be, and um, you look at that electric chicken um, section, and a lot of times if you know, might be one or only one or two packs there. So you know, that's kind of your dead giveaway. That's freaking awesome. Yeah. That, that's Bottom another show we could do. It's just about yeah. the saltwater stuff we could do yeah. around here. Guys, close. It's good to hear him yeah. say, too, like with being jet boat guys and you said the kayak and even the, the boat ramp etiquette, too. Mm-hmm. And, and it is respect. You're all, everybody's using the same resource. And 
and just if they need to have respect for the boaters and the boaters need to have respect for them and if everybody can kind of just approach like you were saying you know hopefully everybody can get along and catch those those fish guys you know thank you so much for joining uh do we have any closing thoughts from all of our fans here on this live recording of jake's bait and tackle all right going once going twice all right awesome jared close us out guys thanks uh just appreciate all all your uh, information <laughs> and uh that's yeah, just one thing we've loved about the bait shop too i know you mentioned too about the winter fishing and you know having not starting off doing a lot of it but you soon find out that you can catch some of your biggest fish in the winter time and the and the fish never there's no season on it they don't just stop eating uh you might not catch the numbers but you definitely can catch the size and just you know the information and knowledge that comes through this place from guys like you and it's cool to see the relationships build just like you're talking about with doc ethco just you know the the relationships and friendships that have developed on the waters uh and then people that come in here and meet and like you're saying from taking young kids fishing taking each other fishing taking older folks fishing it's just you know something we all enjoy and so that's just been really cool to see and we appreciate all, all that you all do you're welcome glad to be here Guys, I hope everyone has a safe holiday season. Uh, like and subscribe to the channel. A little housekeeping thing. I am doing a members-only live stream on Patreon with uh, with Jeff Green of Shallow Water uh, Guide Service Christmas Eve morning. We're going to be doing that. So uh, if you guys were wondering what happened to that, that's what we're doing there. Uh, and then we got some other cool things happening uh, next week as we get to it. And I don't know if we made this announcement. Uh, Jake's and Fishing the DMV, we're all going to the Richmond Expo again. Uh, booths are going to be in the same place. I'm going to take a picture of that and I'm going to post it on social media. That way you guys can find us a little bit easier, but you can find us there. Like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.